Okay, could you introduce yourself for the audience, please? Yes, of course. My name is Gino Santa Maria. I'm a, an artist. I do mostly oils. I am originally from Peru, South America, but I have been living in the United States uh, since 81, actually. Um, yeah, I'm very passionate about what I do, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to this interview. Great, so great. Um, Gino, I was having a good look for your Instagram uh, before. Your trees are incredible. Oh, thank you. Are, are trees your um, favourite thing to paint? Are they something you're drawn to in particular? Yeah, very good question. My children, tells they tell me very often that all you paint is trees. <laughs> and I tell them that's all we have in the Midwest. <laughs> yes, yeah. Now, because of that, yes, I have developed a very, I'm very fond of trees, of course, but I like to paint everything. Um, there is a gallery uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, that represents my work. It's called uh, Legends of the West Gallery. And uh, obviously, every gallery carries the local you know, flavor in artwork. So, yes, I produce work also from that region. You know, I yes. travel there and paint and, and what, you know. But so every gallery that, I, that represents me carries work that is uh, that relates to the environment mm. where they operate so to yeah. answer your question yes and no mostly yeah. i do paint trees though yes and not many trees in new mexico i guess not too many there yeah. are some beautiful areas near taos that is just mm. incredible mm. Uh, they have a lot of cottonwoods and those turn bright green in, in the in the fall it's just beautiful lovely and i noticed as well and i really like your mountain paintings so paintings where you've got the mountains and mountains are particularly difficult to paint um yes more in in i think the tones and the colors of them it's a sort of blues and grays within there which mountains are you painting first of all? Uh, some of the mountains that i have painted are from colorado yes yes some uh, are from uh, wyoming Yes. And uh, then I did also one from uh, Spain, actually. I yes. visited uh, Spain last, the end of the fall last year. Exactly. And uh, we were in different places in Madrid, you know, in the surrounding areas. And uh, mm -hmm. there was this mountain that just completely caught my eye. Mm -hmm. and I painted it, that as well. It's the Sierra Nevadas, I think, in, in, in Spain. Um, I remember going up near Granada um, it's yeah. very beautiful it's it's truly beautiful I mean Europe is so incredibly beautiful I love painting just everywhere also I have painted mountains from the northern Andes of Peru yes that's what I was going to ask and by the way I am preparing to go on a trip for three months to the northern part of Peru and then from that area, I'm going to be branching out to Argentina, Brazil, yes. uh, painting, painting. Wow. So I'm very the, excited about that. The Andes, I've never been there. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time in the Himalayas, um, oh. but not the Andes. But um, I mean, that is one mountain range. I mean, that's uh, amazing. Did, yeah. did you grow up close to the mountains? Good question. Yes, I was born in a small town, very idyllic, beautiful then, uh, a small town of about 50,000 people in the northern part of Peru, in a state called Cajamarca. And uh, I grew up there until I was 13 years old. And uh, mm -hmm. it is perfect there they, that's where i be headquartered you know when i go for three months yes uh it's the weather is absolutely perfect year round sunny yeah. most of the time and uh the high temperature in the summer is probably 70 degrees wow. and the lowest in the winter at night maybe 45 50 so <laughs> Nah. you can't ask for a better place yes yeah. have you ever been down to, to patagonia Damn. I have not. It's, I am playing with the idea. Mm. Um, my two daughters, one who just graduated from college in Spain, and now she's back in the States, and the younger one, which is who is 20, 
they uh, have decided to join me on the trip. Oh, so wow. That's I right. know they want to go everywhere. So yeah. let me ask him about Patagonia. Have you been there before? No, I've, I've always been fascinated by it. Um, because, it, I mean, you're going very, very south. And, of course, it, it like when you go very, very north, it starts to get quite cold. And, it, yeah. and it's interesting as well down there that Simon is from... Wales in the United Kingdom and down in Patagonia they actually have a, a very big Welsh um, population there, a Welsh community. Um, so I've always been, fasc I'm, I'm fascinated by those sort of strange out there places that, that yes. are a little bit different. Yeah I have a twin brother who is also an artist and he mm -hmm. actually lived in London for a while he absolutely right. loved it. He made yeah. great friends, and it's a great, very artistic place as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, what does your brother paint, Gina? He paints the same as me. Yeah, he, yeah. Paints oils, and he likes to do plein air. He has so many other interests. Like yes. he plays a classical guitar. Wow, uh, that is he's very passionate. So he doesn't go with me as often as I would mm. like him to, but we do go together on quite a few trips that we take. Uh, okay. We like to visit national parks yeah, uh, here in the United States. So we, we, we do a trip about once a year for a week or two, and yes, a painting trip. Mm. <laughs> so, it's a very creative family. Yes, in, yes, indeed. Very, very creative. I have a sister also who is on Instagram and she makes dolls. She has these beautiful dolls, and she has 65,000 followers. Wow. <laughs> you know, 65,000 people who are passionate about dolls. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You didn't creative. know it existed, but it does. <laughs> oh, yeah, very creative family. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Good. And how about your daughters? Are they painters as well? They are very artistic. They are quite talented, but they don't have quite the interest. Uh, yes. Yeah. It might I come. One, right. Yes. One of my daughters, my oldest daughter's paintings is in a prominent space above the fireplace in my house. Yes. But that's the only painting that she's done. <laughs> <laughs> but it's beautiful. So yeah. yes, yes, the creativity runs in the family. Okay. So uh, have you always painted? When did you become yes. professional? Um yes. So when my brother and I, I always refer to my brother and I because we were partners in crime and we still are to this day. He lives also in St. Louis, uh, which is great. But since we were eight years of age, I remember we were so passionate about drawing and painting. And with the allowance money that our parents gave us, we would just rush and buy art books <laughs> by Rembrandt and Rubens and Probably people that saw us thought, what is wrong with these kids? You know, yeah. They should be playing out there, soccer, yeah. football, you know, yeah. <laughs> instead. But of course, soccer is a passion of mine as well. But so, yes, we always knew. And then when the time came, um, but let me backtrack a little bit before. Mm -hmm. When we were 13 years of age, my brother and I were accepted into the atelier of one of the most prominent Peruvian artists. We were still living in Peru at the time. And uh, Ismael Vanini, oh, what an artist he was. Very unorthodox way of teaching he had, but you know, he never taught you directly. He made you look for the answers, which drove me insane at times. But so we grew up uh, in that environment, every weekend, you know, every vacation day, we were painting in his studio. Mm -hmm. And we learned to copy the masters, Rembrandt and Rubens in particular, those mm -hmm. two. Um, later on in life, we worked for years creating those uh, reproductions of the masters. Until then, I discovered planar painting. But anyway, mm -hmm. at the age of 18, uh, or around that time, my dad said, kids, what do you want to do for a living? We say, we want to be artists. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> and dad said, I tell you what, um, I'll pay for school. You guys get a, 
you know, a doable profession, you know, a worthy profession. That's how he put it. And the deal is this. Once you finish, you can do anything you want to, including painting. That's a deal. So my brother start, studied hydraulic systems engineering. And in fact, he got a, a, a <laughs> master's in it, you know. Yeah. And I studied genetic engineering. Don't ask me why, but I wow. did. Now, that was a game changer for us because it said something in my head that was just glorious mm -hmm. because I started seeing everything as cause and effect, mm -hmm. including art. Painting is so scientific if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Color theory is... Is not a wishy-washy oh, concept that no. somebody invented. It's real and it's scientific. Yeah. So it really set me on a course that I never imagined before. I moved to the United States later, you know, and I became a full-time artist. Um, but then I got married. <laughs> <laughs> that changed everything. <laughs> I never stopped painting almost full-time, even though I was working full-time. Yes. And uh, so fast forward to today, that's mostly what I do. I do a bit of um, IT work on the side yes. and it's been really helpful. But, and I, at one time in my life, I used to be a member of the media. I cover presidential elections for, uh -huh. uh, for you know, every four years. If you Google my name, Gino Santa Maria, you'll see actually quite a bit of my photographs, you know, from, <laughs> Uh, all the you know the the Trumps and the Clintons and all wow. the, all these uh, photos, but that is that is way in my past. I don't do that anymore. I'm no longer a member of the. I didn't renew my credentials because I yeah. want to pursue painting full time. Yeah, so yeah, that's where we are today. So it will be soon that you Google your name and it's mostly your paintings yeah. rather than your, your press images. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, the press images I no longer do. Uh, yeah. the, the, the good news is I still collect royalties for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I want to dedicate myself fully, 100% to painting. Fabulous, good. So a day say if you've got a full day no responsibilities other than painting how would you start that day where would you go and yeah. what would you do really good question um the reason i brought up the studio painting the paintings that we did the recreations and all those things mm -hmm. my brother and i we learned to copy very very well but we couldn't we had a difficult time creating something on our own. And so I tried it, you know, tried to create things in my head and then paint them. It was difficult. Five years ago, I ran into plein air, the practice of plein air by pure accident. Uh, I don't remember even how, but I found myself entering a competition of plein air painting. And uh, the arrogant person in me said, I got this. How difficult can that be? You know, you just paint what you see. It absolutely floored me. Yes. I, I was lost. I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And I scratched my head and I thought, how is it possible that I cannot copy what I see? Well, the light was changing, obviously. <laughs> chasing the light, the proverbial yeah. chasing the light problem. But that set me on a course that absolutely changed my life. Mm. Absolutely. My painting style changed. Uh, I used to produce 10 to 12 pieces every year, paintings. Now I do about perhaps 150 yeah. or more a year because of the practice of plein air. Yeah. So my day usually, no responsibilities, I would get up. At about 10 a.m. because sometimes <laughs> I work late <laughs> yeah. the previous night. So I would get up around 10, have breakfast, and head out the door. Um, I am a part of a group of artists. We get together every Sunday at 9 a.m. at a different location. Just show up and paint. That would kind of be my how I would 
do the day, and then repeat in the afternoon, do another <laughs> painting in the afternoon. Okay. And maybe in the studio, I am not a purist when it comes to planner paintings. So when I come home, I examine the painting, and if it needs a little touch, I do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's really interesting what you said about it, that switch from copying great master paintings, uh, drawings, to then work in plein air. Um, plein air is very, very difficult. I mean, I'm not mainly a plein air painter, though I do do a little bit. And I'm always absolutely blown away with how difficult it is because you've got so much visual information going on around you the sense of depth, the sense of space. Um, and then there's the light, of course. Absolutely. And, and to be able to, to capture um, what you see in that certain amount of time, and you have to rely on your memory to some extent. Precisely. Especially with, I paint a lot of skies and clouds and you, your head can be down mixing and go, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> you look up, <laughs> and especially here, the, clouds move very fast well said you look at yes. it and it's changed so to some extent you have to have that observation and that faith in your memory a little bit yes. and yeah do you yeah. find that's a are you familiar point? with john carlson's book on no. painting the landscape no john uh, carlson was an immigrant to the united states and he wrote a book called Painting the Landscape. Right. It's actually quite cheap. It's about yes. eight, ten dollars on Amazon. But I'm gonna make book, a note of it. Yes. That book has become the Bible of plein air painting in the yeah. United States. Uh, it was written in 1928. So the book is a bit dated as far as English uh, is concerned, but he is just, oh, it's so rich and so good. In his last chapter, he encourages artists to go out, and I've done that before, and it's incredible, the experience. You, it says, go out, don't paint, observe. Yeah. Observe, memorize, go home, yeah. and paint it. Yes. Painting yeah. from memory. Yes. It's very interesting, because I, I teach painting myself, and okay. um, I spend a lot of time in the landscape. Um, and... I don't class myself as a plein air painter because I'm, I'm not a purist, but what I will do, I will go and watch the sunset, watch the sky. And at most I will make tiny, just thumbnail sketches, just with a pencil or a pen of just the composition. But I will remember the light and, and be almost in a, in a meditative way, try and yeah. be as present in that moment as possible. And then come back to the studio with the thumbnail sketch, just the composition, and then try and pour that, that memory in. And this is what I teach as well to students too, especially if you're getting in, um, you know, you get so sort of stressed trying to find air paint go and just be and absorb it all yeah. and then loosen up basically yeah, and go back. yeah it, additionally you are dealing with so many outward conditions yes. like temperatures wind um i was two weeks ago i was in alabama painting and i came to this portion of the ocean the shore you know in a beautiful park and I saw a sign that says, alligators and snakes frequent these shores. Please be careful. So I added those to my list of <laughs> things that can go wrong when you do this. Yeah. I cannot recall one time where I didn't see or a spider was crawling on me while I was painting. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just part of it. In the, in the Midwest here, we have rattlesnakes and we have yeah. uh, all kinds of other snakes. You just develop certain, and chigris, by the way, chigris, right. which I, one of my good friends uh, is very sick uh, with Lyme disease. Yes. So as planar painters, I don't care the temperature is 100 degrees. We wear pants, yes. boots, and then make sure that we wear repellent. Yes. Because yes. we are always out in the woods. And afterwards, you know, we develop, we have developed the practice of checking to make sure that you didn't get any 
yeah. in a rose because yeah. it can be very devastating. This yes, year. it's a it's a very elemental thing, I think, planar painting, and especially uh, where you are in the states. Here, we don't. Thankfully, I mean, we do have ticks and could get mm. Lyme's disease, but thankfully we don't have any rattlesnakes or anything here. We do have a lot of rain, <laughs> a lot of wind. <laughs> so if, you, if you're if you out painting, it's one of those things you have to prepare for. And I think with plein air painting, it, it's analogous in many ways to, to a lot of other things like hiking or camping or Know, being an outdoorsman in that sense yes. um, but that's where the beauty of it is yes it? yes that is uh, i call planar painting also my therapy hour mm. or my happy space yeah. happy place uh it's i don't know it's it's is that time that i connect with nature that i am out there by myself and i prefer the more isolated area, the better, you know. Yes. And uh, just to, to be there, where with no modern distractions, so then that this than the cell phone is just it's an amazing yes. experience to me. Fabulous. I've been doing some plein air painting myself this year, and one of one of my trips, I'd it was going out into the into the mountains because there's lovely mountains not too far away from me, and I've obviously got this checklist of brushes, paints, palette, water, spare water, a few snacks, and you have your easel and your canvas. It's a lot to carry. And I kind of sling a bag over with most of the things. I have like the easel is separate in a little bag over my shoulder. And then the canvas, I just shoved against my back and through the straps and it was just held there. And I primed it orange before going. And I go marching through this field and over a style and then through another field. And I got almost to the end and really close to this part where there were some trees. And I realized my canvas was no longer on my back. Oh, oh no. And I looked back and I could see in the distance this orange corner just poking out <laughs> into one grass. So I go marching through back to the other field to get it and come back. And it's just, it's things like that, which you just think I need to double check out because you just, you know, you know, traipsing yeah. through the wilderness to try and find your spots, which you are inspired and you're going to paint. Is there anything which you've experienced in your trips out in the in the wild where you just think that was a calamity that just went wrong? <laughs> well, the good news for you is that canvas fell before you painted it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So uh, I I believe there are two kinds uh, of planar painters and only two. One those who have lost a painting due to wind or something and those who will there is no other kind <laughs> so yes i have uh, my paintings have fallen on the floor yeah. they have blown off the easel uh, and every friend that i have you know has had some type of experience along those lines but you know also you develop uh, uh, a list or a check for to make sure that you bring everything one time i got they're ready to paint and oops where are my oils yeah <laughs> didn't have them so yeah. thankfully i had uh, met up with a friend to paint and i was able to to use his but mm. it's very you develop those with practice you know to make sure that you have everything in the united states as well as in europe i'm sure year after year after year companies develop new and better easels you know uh, I recently purchased this. It's called the uh, the Soltech Compact, and it's only seven pounds. It literally sets up in ten seconds. Wow! Literally, and uh, it is the ideal solution for me be because I'm about to undertake this trip for three months to South America, and carrying light uh, mm -hmm. luggage was critical. Also, I found that I can take a pad of linen pads and would be much lighter than yeah. to have linen panels or canvases, yes. especially since I intend to do, I don't know, I'm very ambitious, I suppose. I intend to do about 80 paintings or so during yeah. my trip. So, so you know, with you saying with the, so basically sort of sheets of linen primed, um, 
and and looking at your easel there, will will you have to carry a board to tape them to or yes, something like that? Exactly, a board and use clips or yes. tape. You know, or tape. Yeah, tape the corners. Then in this later, yes. So I I have been preparing for that. Uh, also, I have found the Strathmore oil paper. Yes, very very good. I'm delighted. To, yes, to have found that because. I like the texture, you know, and additionally, I prime them one more time. Oh, okay. All my yeah. surfaces with oil ground. Yes. Uh, it, it just is less absorbent and the brush mm. flows easier. Mm. I I do prime everything I paint on, including canvases. Yes. One more time. Yes. One more time. It's interesting you're saying about oil paper because I, I use quite a bit of oil paper. Okay. Um, so... I've gone, I've used the Strathmore one, which is beautiful. Sometimes use Fabriano Taylor, Taylor, I think. Can you write that down? Yeah, so um, Fab, Fabriano Teller, so T E L A, um, which is which is really nice. It's quite a thick paper, um, okay. but it, very robust. Um, I, I've also used the, the Arsh or arches, however you say yeah. it. Yeah. They do their own, but I'm not so keen on it because it's much more like a, a, a watercolour paper. So it's so like a hot press, not like an oil yeah. surface. Um, but here we have uh, Jackson's Art Supplies, which is a, our art supply shop, and they do a fantastic oil painting paper, which is very similar to Canson and Strathmore paper and, and, okay. and, and, and relatively cheap. Um, and especially for if you're going out somewhere plein air painting well it's just so much lighter to carry um yes, quick so much lighter quick question how are you then because the, the carrying wet panels back is tricky how do you carry your wet okay. sheets of paper very good question i don't have it here with me but i have built carriers you know uh, i have built carriers that i use uh, where you slide uh, in this uh, just uh, the perfect slot enough. for each <laughs> paper or canvas that it doesn't touch the, the, yeah. the, the surface. Yeah, but on this trip that I'm about to take, uh, I intend to, to work on, once I get there, I want to work on a carrier that, um, that would actually have the space for a clip so it doesn't move away from the panel, uh, or simply tape it. Just keep yeah. it there till it dries. Uh, build a rack where I yes. can keep my drying paintings, and yes. then eventually, when I come back to the states, I can just pack them with a piece of uh, uh, wax paper in between each. That'll yeah. be it. Perfect. Um, so working on oil paper because. It's it's different then when it comes to to framing them. Yeah. Do you then mount the paintings on paper onto masonite or something like yes. that? Yes, yeah. I do. In fact, I do. Yeah. I use this uh, uh, pH neutral uh, uh, glue and uh, Elmer's glue. Yes, yeah, it's specific uh, glue, and uh, it, it works wonderfully. Now, one more note on the Strathmore more paper. I have tried about three or four other watercolor papers. Yes. And when I apply the oil ground to them, they when they dry, they they warp. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Just, the Strathmore, I mean, is perfect. It's perfect. It yeah. remains absolutely flat. Yes, yeah. After it dries. So the, I'm very delighted to have found yeah. that brand. Yeah, and it's it's finding that, that one that, that works because also, with it we get used to working with a certain surface uh, i think i made a mistake early on of constantly switching up from working on panel to canvas panel to if you get to know a surface really well it's it's just as beneficial as getting to know certain colors yes um for that reason uh my linen canvases are of a certain brand. It's called Centurion. I don't know if you're familiar. I've heard of it. They, they work fine. I have worked on 
more expensive linens and I buy, buy them by the roll, but I have found I'm used to this. So what I have done additionally, I have purchased the same linen in pads, uh, or 10, I believe 10, or I forgot, I think 10 each, but I buy the larger ones and I cut them to size because a friend of mine has a printing company and they have a large cutter that cuts <laughs> to perfection. So yeah, <laughs> I did that and I cut eight by tens and nine by twelves that I will be taking to Peru yeah. for my trip. Right. Same so what, surface, exactly. Same surface. So what um for plein air, what would you what are your normally so normal sizes? Say say eight by ten, ten by twelve? Yeah, my my normal size is either an A by ten or nine by twelve. Those yeah. are my go-to sizes. Yes, and I do have a carrier that I have built that actually accommodates three six by eights, three A by tens, three nine by twelves, and so when I get there, I decide I don't have to just carry one panel um, and it's very, very useful. Occasionally I do a larger piece. This one is a 20 by 24, by the way. And I have already worked two sessions on this one, but I intend to do at least one more or perhaps two more. Really it is not usual that I uh, work on larger pieces like this, but the largest Planar painting I've ever done uh, is a 24 by 30, and it took me five sessions. Wow. The trick about doing something like that is you have to wait for the right conditions, you know, for the right lighting conditions and so forth to be similar to the, the one. I was going to ask, is there a time of day when, because you've got such nice light in your paintings as well, is there? Is it early morning or is it, you know, what's, what's the time of day that yeah. suits you? I prefer uh, late afternoon because yeah. that is when the colors are the richest. But having said all that, uh, there's an expression in planar painting that says, do not chase the light. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, you see something that you like and you start painting, but the light changes. Then you change. Yeah. That is no, no, no. Yeah. Decide what you want to do. Memorize that. And to, in today's world, you have a cell phone. Take a photo if you have to. Yeah. Although a photo is a very terrible yeah. <laughs> representation of what you are seeing because it does not capture the colors right. Yeah. That's why memorization is so important. Absolutely. Because you could be chasing that light all, um, all day. Yeah. All, all day. And there's, there's something about the, the freshness and immediacy of seeing the light that you like. Yes. Um, and then... As an artist, you have then that power, like you were saying, from your memory, from your technique, to be able to capture it like yeah. that. Yeah. And it's it's being able to be completely in the moment. And that is that interesting thing with plein air painting. But yes, it's observation. Absolutely, it's observation. But it's also artistic license as yes, well. Oh, 100%. In fact... Uh, one time when I first started doing planar painting, I was a literalist. In other words, I would see a tree and another tree and another tree. They were perfectly equidistant to each other. <laughs> Boring. Me, I just copy exactly that. Yes. And I, I felt this is not working. My friend, Sean, who is a dear friend, a, a purist when it comes to planar painting, 100% pure, put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Gino, I give you permission to change things. <laughs> I said to him, can I get that in writing? Yeah. <laughs> That's really triggering my head. Now, reading later John Carlson's book, he says in his book, nature will rarely give you the perfect composition. Yeah. It is incumbent upon the artist to arrange embellish or eliminate elements for the landscape in order to suit your composition. Absolutely. Huge um, concept. Yeah. Huge. So, uh, two British, um, famous British painters, landscape painters, uh, Edward Seago, who's a... Oh, uh, of course. 
know, Edward Seagate and John Constable, you know, because, but they would do that all of the time of move things. So, you know, the, the windmill is here and the tree is there. <laughs> move the tree over. <laughs> you create that composition. Absolutely. You are the artist. Absolutely. Now, uh, there is a an artist that I greatly admire. His name is Bill Anton. Bill Anton. Bill really? Anton. Check him out. He is so good. He is so exceptional. He's one of those few artists that uh, every time he sells a paint, I'm, I'm sorry, every time he finishes a painting uh, and he goes to a gallery, uh, uh, buyers have to submit. Uh, wow. Uh, you know, like they do it by draw. Yeah. So many people want his, yeah, that is crazy, right? Wow. That they do a draw on the lucky winner gets to buy that painting. Anyway, Bill Lanton was giving a, a, a lecture one time. And one of the guys said, uh, Mr. Anton, I would give anything to know your secrets. Hmm. And Bill said to him, I tell you what, go out and paint outside every day for a year. When you come back, you will need my secrets. Yeah. <laughs> there is no secret to no. painting. No. And then he says something very important. And I have from that, I have coined a, a, a phrase that I use for my, when I teach. And that is uh, knowledge by itself will make you a better artist. No. But knowledge with practice. You know, the perfect example, I ask my students, how many of you study Spanish in school? Most of them say, and then I say, entonces me entienden perfectamente lo que estoy hablando? And they go, and I go, I thought so. Absolutely. <laughs> you, did, you didn't practice. That's why you yeah. didn't learn it. Yes. And so practice, I mean, knowledge without practice is almost useless. It's just head knowledge. Absolutely. It's... Um, I find this with colour, for example. So for many years before I started taking painting seriously, I bought, you know, every colour theory book possible. And I would go to the art shops and see, say, old Holland oil paints, for example. And I'd see all of the old Holland oil paints and think, I've got to buy every colour, right? So I'd start <laughs> saving up and... Then when it came to actually painting, I'd have all of these colours on my palette, but I'd only use three or four. And it was just this confusion. What I'd done in the end is I got rid of the books. I just put them away. I chose three colours, three primaries. So blue, yellow, and, and I just practice and practice and practice with those three colours and even now I look at the colour theory books and they're confusing to me. Yeah. But three colours plus white, do that every day for, for a year Absolutely. and you will learn so much about yes. colour. Yes. Oh, what an important point, point you just brought up. Yeah. As a formerly, as a recovering studio artist, uh, <laughs> yes. if I was a, that's all I was, uh, my palette consisted of 14 colors. <laughs> I think my friend Sean, the one I referred to before, mm. Sean Cornell, fantastic artist, 100% purist. He will not do a, a single stroke in the studio. Mm. If he does not finish a piece on the field, he simply wipes the painting wow. much to my, like, no, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But uh, he challenged me. He said, I challenge you to use three primary colors, a limited palette. Which yeah. is cool. And I just thought it was not possible. Once I started using it, though, oh my goodness, yeah. the color harmonies you can create with three colors are Absolutely. tremendous. Yes. Yeah, to your point. The way you yeah. Said. And you also learn its limitations. So, for example, I also do this with teaching is work with color triads. So your three primaries, let's say I'm using a ultramarine blue, um, a quinacridone magenta and cadmium yellow. What I'll often do is switch it up. So I'll then keep the ultramarine blue, but for the red, burnt sienna, and for the yellow, yellow ochre. 
right? And then switch it up again and have cobalt blue, um, burnt umber and Indian yellow. So you, you've always got that red, yellow and blue and your eyes, how they tune into the, these limited things. And you then understand the limitations. So for example, every now and then, you know, a, an ultramarine blue, even with little bits of yellow in it, is never going to create that kind of cerulean colour that is in the sky. Precisely. So then you think, okay, well, let's try a split primary palette so we have a warm and a cool. Yeah. So you start with the most limited and then think, oh, I've hit the, the threshold, I've hit the... So let's add something else in rather than having... Um, you know, a hundred colours. <laughs> Where do I start? Start with the basic and then step up from that. Perfect. Good point. Um, I started, I adopted a limited palette for my yeah. planner work. But soon, once I got very comfortable with that, yes. to your point, I, I discovered that it's you are limited. That's why it's called the limited <laughs> palette. But then I listen to a teaching by uh, 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 an artist by the name uh, Smith, and he suggests that you introduce a warm and a cool color of which are your primary. Yeah. So I introduce the light yellow, and then the cr alizarin crimson for my cool red, yes. and then the, the cobalt blue for my cool and that just changed everything. His name is Matt Smith. I don't know why. That's right. Matt That's Smith, good. fantastic artist from, from the, the West, you know, the, you know, from Ariz the Arizona area. Yeah. And then Scott Christensen, another amazing artist, yeah. Christensen, not Christensen, but Christensen. Scott Christensen suggests you put you use other colors like uh, viridium green or black. Mm -hmm. to bend colors yeah don't influence them too much just bend them a little bit yeah just a touch to just the color that you're looking for yes because you use a lot of green obviously because of your yes. trees and green is a notoriously <laughs> difficult color yes. um so you've got some colors on your palette behind you what are they and how do you mix your greens so uh, can you see it? Okay. Yes. So here, these are my primaries, my yeah. yellow, red, and blue. But yes. then I I use the viridium green yes. as a bending color, as a cooling color. Yes. Uh, because the Midwest where we live, uh, that's all you have in the summer, starting in the spring all the way to the beginning of the fall. That's all you get, greens, greens, and greens. Yes. Yeah. So knowing how to properly paint them is hugely important Absolutely. because my greens start diminishing in chroma with the distance and also in value. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you have to, as an artist, exaggerate a bit because you are doing a painting, not a photograph. Mm -hmm. So yes, and then I also use uh, ivory black right. as a bending color to to kill the chroma a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Sometimes you get colors that are just too unnatural. So yes. being able to use your grays throughout the painting is hugely important mm -hmm. because it creates atmosphere. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, I mean, ivory black and cadmium yellow make great greens. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, for for the long forever, for ever since I've been painting, I have used cadmiums, you know. Yeah. But for the first time, I'm using now from Winsor and Newton, which is my yes. favorite brand, uh, cadmium free yellow. Yes, yeah. And cadmium free red. Uh -huh. uh, my and they're good because of my background in chemistry and all that. Yeah. Is that cadmium is a heavy metal, but it's harmful to humans if it's in a water solution uh, it it's, does not hurt you if it's in an oil solution the problem comes if you wash your brushes like i do you know you put water and soap and then uh, you 
Ah, uh, now you have a water soluble solution on your hand, although the skin is not very absorbent. That's why yeah. that's why the function of the skin to protect yeah. it. Still, just to make sure, because at one time I wasn't feeling quite well. So uh -huh. I decided maybe I need to make a change with my cadmiums. Uh -huh. So I went to cadmium free and it's uh -huh. been it's been great. What's the opacity like? Uh, okay, I use um, artist, uh, uh, yeah. the artist, uh, um, not the, the, the student, but the artist yeah. uh, oils, and the opacity is tremendous. Is it right? Really, really, really good, yes. Yeah, because that's what I, um, I mean, I use mainly cadmiums, uh, original cadmiums, and it's always, you know, the reason is for that opacity, and I know that they have for uh, many years tried to create cadmium hue, you know, yes. where, I where do they can, you, but no. it's not like that. It's, it's, no. yeah. I am, I am pleasantly surprised how mm. the opacity is, is one. I, I cannot tell a difference. Uh, yes. Everything started when Winsor and Newton offer it, to offer me free samples to try them out. So I thought, what do I have to lose? I tried them and I was frankly uh, astonished how well they were. Yes. Great, great. Good. So going back to trees, is that um, we, we have these Scots pine trees here, which are so beautiful. And um, I didn't pay attention to them um, so much before, but now, I just keep looking at them all the time and I can see them and I haven't painted them yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Do you have a particular tree that is your tree, your go-to tree? Uh, I like oak trees and there's a wide variety of them. Mm -hmm. I like ash trees as well. Mm -hmm. And cottonwood trees are so beautiful in the fall, as well as maple trees. You know, here we have abundant uh, yeah. Uh, an abundance of, of maple trees and different varieties. So mm -hmm. now I'm finding myself mentioning too many trees. So I guess <laughs> <laughs> I like them all, but they yeah. are just, uh, oh, um, I like them all. Maple trees are beautiful in the fall as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. In the Midwest. Those, co those colors are incredible. Yeah. Sort of rusty, red, yes, gold. Absolutely. And knowing your trees, I think, is important too. Yeah. And yeah. In, I use an app, you know, to identify them. Uh, where they cannot tell what kind of tree yeah. it is. Yeah. And then once I identify it, uh, I read a little bit about it to make sure that I, you know, understanding your subject is mm -hmm. very, very important. Just like when you paint a person, you want to know the, the, the personality. Yeah, yeah. And John Constable with his clouds, so Constable. Oh. On Hampstead Heath in London, he would sit there painting the clouds, and he he would actually go along then to the Royal Institute um, or Royal Society. I can't remember anyway the the Science Institute in London, and he would go and he would talk about the clouds to these scientists because he built a relationship with the clouds through painting them and looking at them. So the arts were feeding into the sciences and vice versa. Uh, yeah, in fact, when I was a teenager, I painted a large uh, constable, the the, hay, the wagon, I think it's hay, called, hay, yeah. Hayway, yeah. Uh, yeah. for my parents, and they kept <laughs> it in their family, in their living room for years. <laughs> now my sister has it. Yeah. Yes, uh, I was, growing up, I was obsessed with constable. It was... Yeah. Uh, he was how one of my favorite artists. How important is abstraction in your process? You know, to like make sure certain things aren't as fully rendered as others. Okay, very good question. In the background, I have a very large painting that I did. I think I finished that in 2006. And the only reason I keep it, okay, is so to remind myself how not to paint. <laughs> I've been tempted many times to paint over. In my new discover, newly discovered style, it has so much detail, so much detail. Yeah. But let me remove this. So much detail. Yeah. But um, 
I am discovering to, to answer your question that being able to create abstractions in the micro level, you know, but then that express something representational is a thing of beauty and of great satisfaction for me. Uh, yes, I am trying to be more loose, you know, uh, and create more abstractions that speak of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not easy. <laughs> no, it's, it's been done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and it's interesting because your painting there actually reminds me of how you aim a little bit. Yeah, it does. The, the, the composition. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting when, when you look at Constable. Um, so my favourite Constable paintings are his oil sketches. So the ones that weren't shown in the Academy because they weren't rendered well enough. Wow. But um, they're in the Victorian Albert Museum in, in London, and they are the loosest, oh. most luscious and amazing um, paintings, which went on to influence the Impressionists. And um, but at the time, they were seen as crude and um, unfinished. But the way he captures um, clouds or a bit of land, it's just through these brush strokes. So from a distance, you look at it and it's a cloud, you get close up and it is Very abstract. purely painterly abstraction, it, just incredible. And um, I think that that is that that goal as painters that we, you know, we, we sort of start tight and precise, but as you get that confidence and develop, it's that, that looseness, but how you, 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 you keep that fine line between abstraction and representation is the difficult part. Yes. I, I believe most artists progress to the more abstraction mm. type of work. Uh, I have been intentionally trying to become more loose, uh, but Sometimes using, for example, larger brushes. One of my friends says, use a brush that is a bit larger than you would normally mm -hmm. use. Uh, that helps. Uh, yes, yeah. To create more abstractions. And another one is be more generous with the amount of oil that you use. Uh, because I was trained in the classical uh, style, the lighter the color, the thicker the application and vice versa. You know, if it's a darker color, I just put thin layers, like Rembrandt, much like Rembrandt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like you were saying there about using the the big brush. Um, going back to to how I teach, I will just use those three colors, but give them all a. I'll find one of the brushes very quickly. Yeah, and while you do that, uh, I'm going to mention. I am delighted that years ago I found Rosemary and Company brushes. That's mm -hmm. all pretty much I use. They are just amazing. And you have to try different types. Yeah. You know, uh, I have found that for me, uh, for me, uh, this uh, classic long flats are the best. Yeah. And that's for Rosemary and Co. Yes. Yeah, they're very, very good. So this here, you'll laugh. <laughs> this is the brush that I give all of my students. It is so crude. It is so clumsy. But this with three colours. And everybody gets the same brush and one palette knife as well. Oh. Mm -hmm. So with this, you're, you're forced to, first of all, be loose but because it's such a a kind of a a blunt instrument what it means then is then when you do pick up a rosemary and co brush <laughs> you're like wow this is a good tool because you've come kind of let's say from poverty in that sense by using something like this but what it does it helps you to to be so much looser and to think, well, you know, how can I get a small um, detail in here? Detail with that. You know, to, to, you're using little parts of the brush like this, and then one palette knife. And, and, and what I find is uh, people start really loose. 
and then they start to tighten up with it because the skills they're, they're getting. So rather than starting really tight and then trying to get looser, they're starting very, very loose and then learning how to render things a little bit better just with those um, those blunt instruments. And I actually use these a lot as well. I bought, I bought <laughs> loads of them, <laughs> probably for schools or something, but they had boxes of 10 of them for one pound and I bought oh, you know, <laughs> 30 boxes or something. But yes, and your, your, um, your idea has totally intrigued me. I think I want to try something yeah. like that, see yes. what the results are. Yeah, yeah. And because you've already got those skills, you know, but you limit, like with the limited palette, that you limit yourself just to that really. And of course, when you first do it, you you want to throw the brush out the window or snap it over your knee. But <laughs> but it it just gives you you know it gives you that looseness um, because of its limitations. And then when you do pick up your lovely rosemary and cow brush, you're like, this is heaven. <laughs> true. Yes. It, additionally, I keep a few uh, rudiment, rudimentary brushes. Some yes. are uh, not in the best shape to, to create some details that yes. something different effects. Yes. So I do that as well. But Can my I... workhorses are rosemary brushes. Yeah. I just love yeah. them. I love it. Just I bought quite a few of them, by the way. You know, I try this and I try that, and but this particular um, classic long flats, I yes. have found them to be the best for my style. Yes, and again, it's those things like you were saying about the canvas, the linen. The, the more one gets um, accustomed to their tools, you know, the, the better you can paint. Yeah, in that sense, yeah. I have even tried, for example, Clayson's uh, linen. Yeah, it's very expensive. I I liked it, but it didn't really. It, it didn't hit home with me. Yeah, yeah. I had a briefly had an art mentor, and she she was very similar to your atelier experience to the extent that she came from the school of Rubens. So she was very thin with the layers of paint. And she also, it made me smile when you said how unorthodox your, um, I, I can't remember the chap's name who you said would, would teach. And she was very similar where it was like pulling teeth, trying to get any information yes, out. Yes, that's what it was. So, and yeah. I used to do it by reframing it as her work, because otherwise if she was to reflect on my work, she'd just be supportive and say, very good, or where's this you know where's the light and where's the you know she just asked me about the scene as opposed to my work yeah and I used to have to say to her if you made this what would you change she said, oh well in that case and that was the only time when she'd say I changed oh. this you'd have to consider that and think about that <laughs> is there anything where when you were in that atelier where you there was something which was was you actually did get some imparted knowledge which was you know not you didn't have to kind of uh work out in it in some kind of trickery to get the uh get the words uh, yes well uh, his work was well sought after um every single painting he ever painted just would you know sell and his clientele was uh, in general very wealthy people mm. so but so he always used the best of the best in everything the best oils at the time in peru and I believe they still are. Winsor and Newton were some yeah. of the best. And uh, that carry to us. But uh, I think just his passion and attention to detail was incredibly important. I remember one time he said, OK, boys, you are going to copy this portrait of Rembrandt, that he, a portrait of a man extremely loose, just unusual for Rembrandt to be that loose, very abstract. I think we spent three months or so working on that. He wanted every brush stroke wow. identical. So finally, thank God we are done here. He goes, okay, very good. I have your next project, boys. You are going to do it again. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah. That's <laughs> so good. That, that taught us 
there's something to be learned even when you think you already have it just to to, to reach deeper farther mm-hmm. you know that was in essence what we got from him he was a perfectionist to the core yes. and uh, to find you know, never be satisfied with the painting until you really are in other words is this all up all i'm able to do this is all I'm, I'm capable of producing. If the answer is no, then it's not finished. Yeah. And that, that discipline as well of it being, um, I've talked to people before who say they would like to be artists and they say, but, you know, I, I don't get inspired that much to, to paint. I said, you're getting it wrong, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know insp- I mean, I can't remember who it said it but sort of talent was um one percent inspiration 99 percent yeah. perspiration yeah. you know but it's this idea that you that you turn up and like you were saying with your teacher there that it's a discipline to be a painter to yeah. to be an artist both in the learning but also in the um the mode of 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 being an artist you you have to turn up and you and and the more you do it the more you do it the more passionate you become uh, absolutely you don't have to force yourself Uh, a quick anecdote i have a friend who is a motivational speaker he does that for a living years ago he was trying to uh get me to you know to, to to hire him so he can so he wrote me an email and saying, Gino, how would you like to get up in the morning and say, I cannot wait to do this and be passionate about it. And when the end of the day comes and you have to stop, you get mad because you have to stop. So I I answer the email, dear Mark, which is not his name, you know. (laughs) I said, dear Mark, um, if I get even this much more passionate about what I do, Mm. My wife would probably leave me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're very true. Very, well, and it, it, it is such a passion, isn't it? It's and a I, passion. I, yeah. I'm sorry to have to wrap up. We're so close to half past now. So I just want uh, to ask, is there anything you'd like to promote as far as an exhibition or your social media? Where would you like people to go and see well, you? I think, yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking. I think the easiest way to find me and follow my work is on Instagram which is Gino, G-I-N-O, Santa Maria Art. That is the easiest way I, I post there, everything that I do from day to day basis. And uh, I think that is the best. And my website, of course, GinoSantaMaria.com. Fantastic. Well, you've been so generous with your time. I really appreciate you being yeah, here. It's been a great conversation, Gino. Yeah. Likewise, guys. Thank you so much for having me. And I wish you all the best. Thank you.